Once again, welcome to this edition of Digging the Details with Jim and Dean. This is our first full length uh, video together. So uh, we hope it's going to be something you'll enjoy and look forward to. We think we have a great subject tonight. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce once again, uh, my co-host here, <laughs> Dean, <laughs> Dean Brinkerhoff, and he is a uh, artist and a writer and a Disney aficionado par excellence. Thank you for that intro, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor to join Jim Fanning, uh, author, blogger, writer, historian, aficionado of Disney as well, <laughs> and uh I'm excited to talk about some Mars and Beyond today. Thank you for that great introduction, Garko. And we are going to be talking about Walt Disney's Mars and Beyond, which was presented on the Disneyland TV series in 1957, uh, December 4th, I believe, and as part of the Tomorrowland segment. It's an interesting aspect of the history of that TV show is that, that uh, Walt was either creating or relying on his film library to fill out the other lands, the other realms of Disneyland. It was decided to explore the whole idea of space exploration, <laughs> which was certainly in its definite infancy in the 1950s. So this was far reaching and visionary and revolutionary stuff. So, um, it's also interesting to note that um, this was before the month was out, the end of December 1957. This was even released to theaters uh, as a feature at Mars and Beyond. So it uh, has a fascinating history, and we're going to look at, as we like to do, some of the details. So I'll turn it over to you, Dean, to take it from there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mars and Beyond is certainly an interesting and unique uh, special from Walt Disney. Very interesting to know that it was in theaters too. I think that's something that's new to me today. Um, we learn a lot about um, people's thoughts and theories and impressions about what space exploration would be like, what aliens and Martian people would be like. Martian, of course, being uh, many luminous birds <laughs> that do not fly. <laughs> the great Paul Freeze accent. <laughs> very, very creative. And I think that's due to a lot of um, just speculation and thoughts about what would life be like on another planet out of that purely genuine curiosity of uh, the humans here on Earth <laughs> looking for something else, something beyond us which ties right into that title, Mars and Beyond, you know, what's out there? The space exploration, like you were just saying, is such an interesting and exciting topic, especially in those days, um, as, you know, NASA was gearing up in the years to come to go to the moon and to explore more outside of our own home realm of Earth. And you can see clearly that Disney was really ahead of its time in many ways. That's one thing I really love to see and focus on with Mars and Beyond and some of the other science fiction Tomorrowland shows that they did in that time. Man in Space and Our Friend the Atom, those are absolutely the same as far as their vision and scope. And you mentioned um, Man in Space. There, there was a trilogy. This is the, Mars and Beyond was the third one. What was the what was the second one? Yeah, Man in the Moon, which um, you know was the second of the trilogy of this series, um, Mars and Beyond being the area, the territory we knew least about. So I think is partially why it's one of the most fascinating of the three. It definitely delves into areas in Mars that were hard to photograph. Um, and hard to really understand or conceive of. So there was a lot of speculation. And it's fascinating that we're, we're talking about this in the year 2021, when we just had 
the most amazing encounter with Mars just a few months ago that we've ever had. Yeah, just recently. With the Explorer um, landing on Mars and sending back all kinds of data. And it seems like it is backing up what was said even in 1957. There is no life there. You know, it, it has its own fascinating um, terrain, but um, it seems to be backing up everything that was uh, known or thought to be known about Mars. And that's probably the, the least of this show, of this episode, because they spend a lot of time with the speculations about if there was life on Mars, what could it be? And, and what kind of animals would live there? What would they do? What would they eat? One of the little artifacts that I have is the comic book, Mars and Beyond. And this was published in 1957 to coincide with the show being on TV and then in the theaters. A science feature from Tomorrowland. And they did three of these. They did one for each of the shows. So this is Mars and Beyond. And it's fun to see the different way the comic book approached the same material. First of all, <laughs> I, I've never been, as a collector, I've never been obsessed with having like mint copies. So somebody cut. <laughs> so we cut a little cut out. <laughs> That's unfortunate. And I like to imagine some reader having this comic book and they decided to make a, a science project out of it because throughout there are some little panels cut out. That's probably, and, yeah. I remember doing projects like that. Oh, great. Yeah, see, here's a page that... <laughs> I certainly wouldn't have cut out that one. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same material as the show, but uh, done kind of a different way. But you can see they're trying to draw upon the style of the characters. Uh -huh. And it's really a fun version of this whole thing in its own right. We have these wild characters. Anybody that's seen it will recognize these kind of cartoony, I guess I should say. <laughs> and they, there's a whole segment in the show about them, but they don't go into that too much. They get kind of more into the science about life on Earth and then what could life on Mars be, knowing what we know, what life needs to survive water and some kind of you know atmosphere yeah they really go right from the start as far as scientific thoughts on evolution and the na natural progression of life on earth and how you know oxygen plays into all that and our relationship with it it's very very fact-driven as well as having that fun creative spirit Absolutely. And, and speculating one part of the show, which is part of all three of the episodes, is if we were going to go to Mars, how would we get there? What would be required? So there's, there's a whole section on the spaceships that would be needed. And this is a pretty spectacular spread. So this comic book is really well done. And it reminds me that one thing Walt Disney said about the science factual, not science fiction, but science factual shows, is that he didn't want flying saucers or anything like that. But in Mars and Beyond, uh, there are finally... There's one behind saucers. you right now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> flying saucers shown because this, again, was the most speculative of, of the three shows. So they, were, they allowed themselves to to cut loose on that. But I had mentioned that uh, these um, really cartoony aliens that are drawn with so much imagination, and they, they are from the very fertile and wild imagination of Ward Kimball, who was the producer, writer, director of these shows. Walt Disney had turned to him to create these because... Uh, Ward actually knew a little bit about space exploration because he had been reading articles that were hard to come by at that time. In Collier's Magazine, they had done a series on the science of space exploration and what it could be. So he had already had a background in it. That's definitely something that's new to me. I, no wonder he was chosen to 
be really an integral part of these science factual shows. He um, definitely was one of Walt's nine old men and was uh, one of his more impertinent <laughs> employees. <laughs> Lord Kimball, I, uh, I've heard several stories about him, but one of my favorites came from um, a really famous animator, Floyd Norman, um, who's still with us today. Not one of the nine old men, but he was one of the younger students in that time, time of Sleeping Beauty, a little bit after Mars and Beyond. Um, the story went on that, you know, the animators really had a lot of respect and reverence for Walt Disney and his ideas and really what his vision was, what he wanted for the projects. Ward Kimball, however, really was very, very uh, creative. And he thought stuff was funny sometimes that maybe clashed with Walt's vision. And he had this hilarious idea in this little soap opera sequence of Mars and Beyond where the aliens are chasing after this poor woman, um, you know, the damsel in distress, while the hero is waiting to save her, and all these crazy, you know, blob with a million eyes and thing with three heads is chasing her. And he thought, what what a wonderful idea it would be to have Donald Duck run past, quacking and <laughs> trying to get the girl. And Walt Disney shot the idea down immediately. He said, nope, that's, he's the duck. We're not going to use him for this. This is just, it, it doesn't make sense. It's inappropriate for what we're trying to show here. And he's like, come on, Walt, just a little gag, a little gag. And <laughs> Walt said, no, but at the screening that Floyd remembered being at, all of a sudden on screen was Donald Duck. And <laughs> he remembered at the end of the screening, seeing Walt and Ward having a little discussion afterwards <laughs> <laughs> and them both not looking super happy afterwards. <laughs> I thought that was a hilarious insight into one of my favorite scenes of Donald Duck. Donald Duck is, of course, a favorite, but that cameo in particular always gets a huge laugh from me. <laughs> it's such a surprise. It is. And I wonder if at that screening it got a big laugh because it's in the show. So um, if something was not wanted by Walt Disney, it would not be in the show. So he must have changed his mind. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. It might have been something he could necessarily control either. I mean, he's Walt Disney. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's on the film now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Ward got him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my... my my guess is that it got a big laugh and Walt was like, well, okay, <laughs> we'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, but I don't, I don't know, but for whatever reason it's, it's in the show. So it kind of shows the, the, um, regard Walt had for Ward. Um, and he was, he was impressed by his imagination for sure. He was definitely an odd one, but a very creative one <laughs> for sure. Ward was working with an incredible team. Um, I forget I forget some of the names now. I would like to name them. But um, Julius Svensson was one, for sure. I think John Dunn. He had a whole little unit of animators that and uh, story artists that helped him create these shows. And they, they worked together very closely to do it very creatively. And they were just some of the uh, creative talent involved. One that I would like to point out is Paul Fries. He does all the voices that you hear with all the voices of the philosophers, the scientists, and the, he's the narrator. Uh, and this is a picture of him. I like to show this because so few people have seen Paul Fries and know, know what he looks like. And here he is. And of course, he's here with uh, Ludwig von Drake. Uh, the character that was uh, such an important part of Disney TV in the 1960s. So they did some publicity, and he was a great favorite of Walt Disney and the Disney artists. Um, and he does uh, quite a few voices at, at Disneyland. He's part of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. He's part of Pirates of the Caribbean, part of the Haunted Mansion, where he's the ghost host. And he was one of these artists that one of these voice artists that was known as the man of a thousand voices. 
because he could really just do about anything. So this is a great uh, press photo that I have. And on the back, there's even the snipe with complete with this great Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color logo. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that great? That's a fantastic treasure. So uh, it's really wonderful to uh, see um, Paul Fries uh, as opposed to just hearing him. And it's also funny because here he is with Ludwig von Drake and Walt Disney reused the animation for Mars and Beyond, at least some of it, in the 1960s with the von Drake program that was um, Inside Outer Space. So they had Ludwig, Ludwig von Drake narrating some of that same uh, animation footage that was originally wow. in Mars oh. and Beyond. <laughs> So I would have loved to see that. Ties it all together with, with Paul Fries. There was a lot of science factual material. Uh, aside from the wild and zany animation, uh, they definitely had um, a serious scientific side. And as always with these three episodes, they brought in uh, scientific personnel to, be, to participate in these shows and add the whole um, factual part of the show. So you have a connection with with part of that from Mars and Beyond, right? Yes, I do have an interesting connection um, as far as that goes. I myself am from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is um, the location of Lowell Observatory, which is featured in the film. and. Uh, Percival Lowell founded, of course, the observatory, and you can see this beautiful, um, well, I guess I would call it like a white dome tower um, called the Clark Building, and it's named after Alvin Clark, the designer, um, and he had a scientific career there for the longest time. Um, Lowell Observatory, a little fun Fun fact is the location of the discovery of the dwarf planet Pluto, which sometimes a lot of people don't realize as they come through Flagstaff. I've been up there many times. I myself have always had really, really bad, unfortunate circumstances where I haven't been able to tour it myself despite living there my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been up to there, um, to the observatory up on Mars Hill, and named that for all of its wonderful contributions to Mars and discovering more about it. There was a lot of photography done there and a lot of developments with their telescopes that allowed them um, to learn more about the red planet and what's there. Um, Flagstaff itself is a dark sky city, which means they have dim lights on the streets to make the sky more visible and it really gets rid of a lot of the light pollution that occurs in a lot of cities. Flagstaff itself isn't very big. Definitely big enough that if you had uh, all the normal lights, it would be a little blinding and hard for the astronomers to see at night. So <laughs> that was a big reason that they were able to discover so much. And I mean, Pluto is now no longer considered a planet, but <laughs> definitely a great accomplishment by the people there. One of the professors there, E.C. Slifer, for many years is featured in the film, and he shows off a lot of their discovery and research, and it's always been a fun watch. I remember watching Mars and Beyond as a teenager. I was probably about 14, 15, and just being astounded that my hometown film, yeah, yeah, an obscure one at that, was very cool in a way, and I... I've always liked that and remembered that. Maybe it may be obscure, but it's a fantastic film and fantastic to see that included. I was it's just astounding to hear all the details about that. We see uh footage inside the observatory, and that of course was filmed there in Arizona. But the scenes where E. C. Slifer is talking to us and showing some of his data, I guess you would say. That was filmed here in Burbank. He, he came to the studio 
and uh, a set on a sound stage. So that's really cool to think about too. He must have felt like <laughs> must have felt like a, a movie star. And you had mentioned um, another one of the uh, science factual Tomorrowland shows. Our friend the Adam. I have the paperback version of the book written by Heinz Haber that Walt Disney mentions in the in the show, Our Friend the Atom. And I'm, I feel very lucky to have this. This is even rarer than the hardback uh, original version of the book. The reason I thought I would bring up again Our Friend the Atom is because this was also produced in 1957. So it's astounding to think of the great variety and, and great effort that was being put into the Disneyland TV show in 1957 alone. Think of it. Both Our Friend the Atom and Mars and Beyond were on the, in the same calendar year. <laughs> so for one thing. Yeah, for sure. It's also interesting to note that Our Friend the Atom was done by a different unit. It was not one of the Ward Kimball uh, science factual shows. This was directed by um, Ham Lusk. And when, and if you watch the show, Our Friend the Atom, it's quite different than, than say, Mars and Beyond. Um, it uses the same techniques of live action and animation, animation to show both technical things and more in, visionary things. But the tone is does not have that Ward Kimball humor that you were talking about earlier. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's equally excellent. It's just different because it didn't have the Ward Kimball touch. Here we are talking about Mars and Beyond. Uh, where can people see it if they want to see? Uh, I'm sure many people watching this video have never seen it before. That's a great question. It is actually very... Um loved, beloved, well-known among Disney aficionados. And it's part of um, the treasure set from a few years back. Um, Walt Disney Treasures presents Tomorrowland, Disney in Space and Beyond. <laughs> in addition to a few of the others we've mentioned throughout this program, Mars and Beyond is on there, Man in Space, our friend the Atom, um, among a couple other special tidbits and treats. But this is definitely one of my favorites and includes a little um, bit more of information from Leonard Maltin and a neat lithograph of Space Station X-1. And they even includes a little bit of work from our Jim Fanning here. <laughs> yes, I, I was privileged to work on that set. And the main thing that I did for it was image research because there's galleries among the, the bonus features you're talking about on there. So you can see some of the amazing storyboard art, say, and, and conceptual art that Ward Kimball and his team created to, to produce what we see on screen. So you can see the storyboards where Donald Duck is included. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's pretty deluxe. So they put a lot of work into it, almost more than the features sometimes, because it's all in color. And of course, it, the show at that time wasn't even broadcast in color. So it's pretty amazing they put even that much work into it. But anyhow, oh. I was very honored to go into the animation research library and go through all the files of all the art that was saved for making those remarkable shows, including Mars and Beyond. And um, it, it kind of makes me think again of the comic book because one of the elements of Mars and Beyond was showing comic books that were showing these crazy creatures, these monsters from outer space, because that was a big part of comic books in those days. That these very lurid covers with these incredibly vicious and ugly looking monsters. So uh, Ward Kimmel was having a lot of fun with that. So a lot of those were rendered pieces of art that the camera just shot. And those pieces of art are intact in the animation research library. So wow. I was able to, you know, go through these and in some cases even touch this incredible art. Of course, we use museum protocol with gloves and all that, but it was nice. <laughs> because that, you know, animation research library is state of the art. 
in terms of preserving this priceless and decades old art, but my gosh, and then to be able to include it on the DVD set. So I think it's a real treasure for one of these Walt Disney treasures to, uh, for audiences to be able to see it. And what if, you know, one thing that everybody mentions about Walt Disney Treasures, the, the various sets, is that they were, they're actually quite rare. Yeah. Uh, they, only, they only made a limited number of them, and they were snapped up right away. And today, a lot of people are looking to get them, and sometimes you can find them on eBay for pri they're pricey. So if somebody isn't lucky enough to have Walt, a Walt Disney Treasures set, where else can they see Mars and Beyond? Well, thankfully, it's on uh, the new streaming service, Disney Plus, and it's in a beautiful presentation. I'm used to watching the treasure set. I've been very lucky to have grown up with that set, but now I don't even need the disc. It's right here on Disney <laughs> Plus, and you can also check out uh, Man in Space there, too. It's great. Maybe they'll add Man in the Moon soon. That would be a really fun addition. <laughs> Well, Jim, I also have a surprise for you that relates to Mars and Beyond. I have a little bit of art <laughs> that I made tonight. Oh, you <laughs> just drew that tonight? <laughs> yeah. This is the Martian robot, for those of you who've seen Mars and Beyond, the one that's chasing the woman and causing all the trouble in the soap opera scene. But quick little sketch. I thought it was fun. I love this character. And he's a little rare. He'll pop up every so often and... Mickey Mouse works and House of Mouse, but you don't really see him too much, so I, I had to draw him. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you did, and I love his sneakers. <laughs> I do too. He's got some nice, nice 50s. <laughs> I don't know what they are, Converse or... <laughs> the Martian wore tennis shoes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, what on his face. What a great surprise. I'm glad we saw some of your, your Disney art. It was so one, wonderfully done. Thank you. We've had a lot of fun looking at some of the details of Mars and Beyond, and we hope that you have too. And we'll be back soon with another edition of Digging the Details, because these are the details we like to dig, right, Dean? You said it, Jim. <laughs>